Hi, this is Melanie McFarland from Salon.com, and I am joined today by Marta Kaufman, the fabulous co-creator of Drace and Frankie, and who has a, she also has a lengthy and impressive resume that includes Dream On, Veronica's Closet, and of course, Friends. So I can't tell you how thrilled I am to talk to you today, Marta. There's so much to pick your brain about. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for having me and <clears throat> pardon my guest room background, but uh, I don't have an office in my house. Yeah, I, you know what, I'm sitting in my living room with, um, as you can see, the pictures were stolen from the frames behind me. That's, a, that's, <laughs> I love that's that idea. Somebody else made. I love that idea. <laughs> I think that's fantastic. All right, so let's talk about Grace and Frankie. It is amazing that it went for it went for seven seasons, about what ninety four episodes. That's we sure do. Yeah, that is so impressive, um, and that makes it the longest running original on Netflix too, right? It is. It is the longest running original. Um, you know, we got in at a good time yeah. when they were really just starting to do their originals. Mm -hmm. um, so we got in at a good time. And honestly, we didn't expect more than three years. And we thought, oh, if we get five years, we'll be so lucky. Um, and, and then here we ended up with seven seasons. Now, why did you, why do you say you didn't, it's just your experience in TV. I mean, I know that a lot of times if, if I've spoken to a lot of folks over the other say, if we get past the season, I feel like we, you know, we hit the, the lottery. Um, but why do you think that it was that three years was going to be your no. limit? I, I think at the time it was, we don't know what Netflix is going to be. And if this is going to even, you know, we don't know. We don't know how it's going to do. Um, but also that, you know, Netflix, their primary invest investment isn't in longevity. Right. Of their TV series. They want to keep bringing in with new things and new things. So we didn't know. We just didn't know. Mm -hmm. This is also an extraordinary series. Um, wow, for so many reasons. But one, one of the reasons that I really wanted to um, kind of dive into Grace and Frankie is the fact that we have these two amazing women as leads. We have Lily Tomlin um, and we have, and, and we have, Gra uh, I'm sorry, I also called her Grace. <laughs> and we have Jane Fonda as Grace. So Lily Tomlin is Lily Grace. called her Grace all the time on set. Oh yeah, I, I, I get it. Um, and the reason I, it's not extraordinary that they're leads, it's extraordinary that they're leads now in this part in their careers. This is the first season that, or the first series on which they were both leads, right? That is, that is correct. That is correct. <laughs> were you kind of amazed by that when you, when you, you first know, passed this show? Yes, we, the, it's funny, the way it happened was I was having lunch with the woman who is the then head of television at Skydance, and that's our studio. Um, and she said that she had heard that Jane Fonda and Lily Tomlin both wanted to do TV. Hmm. I thought she meant together. Okay. So I ran back to my office. I called my agent and I said, is it true that Jane Fonda and Lily Tomlin want to do a TV show together? She said, I don't know. I'll call you back. And 20 minutes later, she calls me back and she says, they do now. Ah. <laughs> so, so we started, really we started with our two leads before we really had a solid sense of what the show was going to be. That's incredible. So you really wrote this show around them. Did they, yeah. did they, um, what, did they sit down with you and say, um, kind of bounce ideas off of you or you know, did you have a way, firm idea of what you wanted to tell with the story? Well, we knew that there were certain things we wanted to do. We really wanted to talk about aging. We really wanted to talk about sexuality in older women. We really wanted to talk about being dismissed and marginalized. Mm -hmm. uh, so we knew there was stuff we wanted to talk about just knowing who our leads were. And we had one meeting with them where we all just sat and talked about stuff and they talked about things in their lives. Um, and uh, I'll tell you one story from there. J we were talking about men and Cialis. And Jane said, you know, that's not the only way to help a man get an erection. There's a pump and there's a needle, there's a shot you can give in the penis. And Lily Tomlin says, you have got to get younger boyfriends. <laughs> and Howard and I looked at each other and said, that's our show right there. That's the show. And then what we did is we came up with an idea. We came up with a few ideas. 
landed on one and then we pitched it to them and they gave their feedback and you know from the perspective of to act that role what does it mean and you know what feels comfortable and what doesn't but um we had a number of conversations over the script and they gave incredibly intelligent notes and that was the process from then on i mean they understood their characters and understood what crossed the line or what didn't feel um real enough for who they are and authentic enough for who they are um and their notes were always dead on mm -hmm. so i want to backtrack to something just as you know we we're going getting into this conversation um as i mentioned at the top with all of these shows that you've worked on before grace and frankie you have seen the industry evolve um there must there's a time and i'm not saying there must have been i know there was a time when the show probably could not have been got, gotten made um and now there are so many shows that um none that I, none right now that show women at this age in life but we're seeing women over 40 and their stories more frequently um thank god yeah yes i mean it was obviously an underserved market but what do you think has changed like what, what do you what do you see as the change um that uh, that is kind of opening things up that people no, are like, okay i want to tell these stories it's funny i think the change is niche tv um and everybody's saying oh let's do a show that will appeal to this narrow audience this or or the the audience that went to this show we want that same kind of audience so we have to do the same kind of show and what happened with grace and frankie is proved to not be true that it was watched by multiple generations and not only women mm -hmm. so i mean i think that was a surprise to them but i think that's one of the issues is everybody is being pushed into this tiny little box and here's the brand that the network wants and right now we only want comedy forward no sad comms i mean there are all these rules um which have always been the case i mean there have always been rules even for the networks as well this is what we're looking for mm -hmm. um but because of streaming um and streamers tend to not do long-running series if anything they do short orders it's had a huge effect on writers and crew because they're not getting long orders anymore. So after 10 episodes, they have to find new jobs. Mm -hmm. And they're changing the way we do writer's rooms where they're doing mini rooms before you start production, which I think is insane, but we can get into that another time. Um, so, and the business itself, the industry is becoming more and more corporate. Um, and there are more and more guidelines that are being um, sent from above. So it makes it harder and harder to sell. It's interesting that you bring up that it, it makes it harder to sell, but the fact that it is more corporate, I would think that that would work against a show like Grace and Frankie. Yeah. Did it make it particularly tough to sell? Well, honestly, it wasn't when we started. Mm -hmm. And and we honestly, we we did a lot of years with the the Netflix that was just starting to do shows. We got incredible support. We always got really fantastic notes from them that kept us true to our vision. They were fantastic. When things started to change at Netflix, um we were already established mm -hmm. so at netflix it didn't have an effect on us because we were already a show that was established we were not their problem child mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so in that sense we haven't experienced it but it's more in a lot of the other places that you know it's not it, it's algorithms and um corporations are changing the craft and the storytelling. Do you feel like streaming 
has had an impact <clears throat> either positively or negatively on the quality of television shows? And I know that's tough to answer as a, as a creator, but I, you know, I, you're right in it. So I, 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 I'm just curious to hear from you. Honestly, I don't think it's had a negative impact. I mean, it's, it's a very interesting process, at least it was when we did Grace and Frankie, where you write the first episode and then you go in and start shooting your 13. Mm -hmm. So as opposed to a lot of other models where you do a pilot, they test the pilot, they you know take the pilot apart, but you learn a lot from that process. So when you start the series, you've got all this information. With streaming, at least for us at Netflix, we had to learn as we went along. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're right in production, you're writing episodes that are you know, six episodes down the line. We really had to learn on our feet um, how to walk the line between comedy and drama. Mm -hmm. Let's talk specifically about this final season. Um, you had the challenge of the pandemic um, halting production. Um, how yes, did that change? It took us almost two years to shoot one episode. <laughs> what? How? Wow. We wow. stopped in the middle of an episode. So how did that, how did that impact coming back to that episode? I mean, things physically happen to people. And to, this is two years of my hair used to I be know. long. So <laughs> we had one actor and we're shooting it. And we realize as we're shooting it after the pandemic, he didn't have a beard two years ago. And no one knew. I mean, we're all, we're watching it. And it was just, it was sort of a sudden thing. We're like, oh shit, it's too late. We can't change it now. So we had to use special effects to get rid of his beard. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so yeah, stuff like that did happen. People change, they lose weight, they gain weight. Their hair is different. Um, and everybody's older. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. everybody's older, <laughs> including me. Yeah, it's a, uh, the show started in 2015 and that is a significant change. Um, and as, you know, as, as we age, that amount of time does impact both out like physically, but also outlook. Right. Um, and so going into the finale season, um, what were the stories that you wanted to tell about bringing these characters' lives to a close? Um, and what are some of the things that you wanted to avoid specifically? Not just with Grace and Frankie, but also, you know, with Sam Watterson's Saul and, you know, with, with uh, Martin Sheen's Robert. Like, what are, what are some of the things you wanted to kind of make sure that you establish, but also take care with? Um, a the bottom line core of the show is you can start your life over at any point. And we knew that we wanted Grace and Frankie to be okay. We wanted everybody to be okay. We wanted people to feel satisfied and happy for the characters. And it's a, it's a comedy. Um, you know, we weren't looking to do a musical or make something completely different. We wanted to stay true to the show but find ways to finish our characters that seemed satisfying. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we wanted to avoid um, any dramatic pitfalls that could um, uh, just, it, it would feel like it put the brakes on the show um, if we did anything too sad or too, heartbreaking, um, but we did know that we wanted people to cry at least at one point. So that we wanted. <laughs> did you know the point that you're hoping they're going for the tears or you're just saying overall? Overall, we <laughs> knew we wanted that moment and then we were pleasantly surprised where it landed. Interesting. Uh, so this sounds like, I think, you, I'm sorry, go ahead. You were gonna say something. I was something. gonna say the other thing besides the way to end it is there were other stories we wanted to tell. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we wanted to talk about prescription drug, drug prices, which is a huge issue for that generation. Um, we wanted to talk about memory loss. Um, 
So there were things we wanted to get into that aren't, you know, clowns coming out of a car, um, but we wanted to do it in such a way that you could feel something, but still be invested in the characters and the relationships. One of the things that I read is that you knew how you wanted the show to end for quite some time. When when did you know? Some some I've I've talked to people before and they've said like, oh, from the first season, I knew how this this I knew how this was going to end. I know the line. Um, when would when did you know? Well, we knew certain things. We knew what we wanted the last image to be. We knew what we wanted the last line to be. We had no idea how we were gonna get there. So, you know, a little bit, but I've got to say, you know, we were starting to break the last two episodes right before the pandemic. Um, and it was really difficult, probably the hardest two episodes we've ever done to write, um, to make them feel like, yeah, this is where we're supposed to land. Mm -hmm. This feels right. Do you feel like throughout Race and Frankie, um, again, you've, you have said, you've had seven seasons, um, you have said before that, you know, this was Netflix's choice to end the series, not necessarily yours. Do you feel like you've told all the stories that you wanted to tell? I do. I think the timing is right. Mm -hmm. I think the timing is absolutely right. We've told the stories we wanted to tell. We told the stories we needed to tell. The characters have grown and developed and shows have a lifespan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Shows have a lifespan and, and it's important to respect that lifespan and not overstay your welcome. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I wanted to talk to you about, I, like I said, I've, you know, I've mentioned your experience in the industry before. You've also had the opportunity to write um, several finales, including one of the most watched and anticipated in television history. Um, what do you think goes into making a satisfying series finale? First of all, it's really hard. Mm -hmm. Second of all, if I really knew the answer to the question, it might've been easier to write the end of Grace and Frankie. But I have to say writing the last episode of Friends was also very difficult because even if you know where it's gonna land, you want the road to the trip to be exciting mm -hmm. and surprising. You don't want to feel like you know everything that's going to happen as it's happening. You want moments of, oh yeah, that's what should happen. Not, not just, oh, I knew that was going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it's, it's sort of the, it's the flip side of doing a pilot, which is also extremely difficult where you're establishing the characters and trying to do it with that exposition. It's sort of the flip side of that where you're, um, finishing the characters for the purpose of production, but you want them to feel like they're living on and have a life beyond the show. So you may be saying goodbye to them, but they're gonna be okay. Mm -hmm. I've, um, when I've spoken to uh, creators of series and showrunners before about series finales, um, there seems to be a theme that comes up and you use that word, satisfying. Um, there are some people, I think, that are compelled to search for perfection. And I don't think that's someone who actually, who watches TV. I mean, who makes TV. I think it's people who are watching and who are huge fans. They want the perfect finale. Is that even possible? Nah. <laughs> no, people, someone's going to complain about something. And a lot of people are going to complain about something. And there's nothing I can do about it. And I can't. Yes, I want it to be satisfying for the audience, but on the other hand, I can't worry about the haters. I just can't. I can't worry about the people who will find something wrong with everything. I'm not writing for them. Mm -hmm. um, and and I think I think it's dangerous. I, I've always had a thing about whether or not I read um, a critic's perspective on my work because I believe it was Norman Lear who told me, 
if you're going to believe the good ones, you have to believe the bad ones too. Um, so you're never going to make everybody happy. Yeah. And sorry, <laughs> you know, and, and for me, I want to write a show that I would like to watch where I would feel satisfied. I mean, I can't write for the world. I write or we write for us and hope that it translates. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that I think that Grace and Frankie does, and you talked about this just in terms of getting it made, getting it, you know, getting it out there, is that whenever there is a series that is not necessarily about, you know, 20s, 20 somethings, 30 somethings, you know, um, there's this whole idea of who's going to watch it, right? Like, oh, this is going to have a limited appeal. And yet over and over again, since the Golden Girls, there has been, um, it's been proven that audiences of all ages want to see interesting characters regardless of their, of their age group. Um, why do you think it seems to me that this, that, that there seems to be this repeating like, hey, you know, Ever since the Golden Girls, people have wanted to see the stories of older women, which have been undertold. Um, I know, you know, I know. And, so and you know what? It's dumb. It's dumb. I mean, to be honest, we had the same issue with Friends. Who's going to watch a show about a bunch of 20-somethings? That's and crazy. They wanted, us, they wanted us to add an older character to bring in an older audience. And we said no. Um, my theory is, if you have characters that you want to spend time with, that you care about, um, characters who you're invested in, um, then people will watch. And, and they'll watch it, I think, part of it has to do with what kind of show it is. People aren't watching Grace and Frankie just because it's about two older women. It's kind of a comfort show. Mm -hmm. And they do it because it makes them feel good and feel comfortable and they're inviting their these friends into their homes and and you know people always talk about it are you a grace or a frankie um clearly these characters have resonated mm -hmm. um but i i think that's just part of a limited way of thinking like there's a formula like there's a formula that's going to make the perfect show mm -hmm. you know after friends they all wanted to do everybody wanted to do a show about a bunch of young people um, that's not how it works. The formula isn't what makes it successful. The casting, the writing, the directing, the production, that's what makes it successful. Mm -hmm. I also think that what Grace and Frankie did so well is bring conversations into the mainstream that weren't being had. Um, there's an, I mean, I've said this before, I actually wrote about this, like better things than an entire thing where they had a celebration of menopause. Grace and Frankie talked a lot about, you know, sexuality in women in their 70s and 80s, um, you know, about beauty. Um, the fact that Frankie was a huge pothead, and we're having this conversation on 420, by the way. I know we are. <laughs> you know, these are things that we don't, that, that aren't considered. Um, and it was so refreshing. I think that's part of the comfort too, is just seeing these in dialogue, but also playing out, um, you know, through this friendship that was never like perfect, but right. was very real. And I think that was another element that people really liked is, is their friendship and that you can have the most important person in your life be someone with whom you are platonic. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there's nothing better at a certain age, well, ever than a, a woman friend in your life who you know is there and has your back. Um, and I think I, I think that's part of it. Um, and it's part of the reason that people were drawn specifically to Grace and Frankie. But also, I mean, I had young women saying things, and I've said this before, but I'll say it again saying things like, thank you for telling me about dry vaginas. Nobody talks about that. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for saying, you know, it's harder for a woman to come to orgasm. And it helped, I think, normalize what a lot of people were going through to understand, oh, we all go through that. And it doesn't mean life is over. It doesn't mean sex is over. 
you know, it doesn't mean you, you can't have pleasure. Mm -hmm. It's amazing to me that shows like this are a roadmap um, for these conversations that we should be having with each other. And some of us are, um, yeah. but not enough. It's not, um, so So that's that's been an incredible aspect of Grace and Trek. And I'm glad that we have seven seasons of it to look to look at and, and go back to and take comfort in. Um, yeah, and, and just to close it up, what are you hoping that people take away from that final scene that you knew that you wanted for so long? I'm not going to use the word satisfied. <laughs> I guess what I would love for people to feel is a kind of bittersweet joy. Um, that's what I'm hoping they feel. That is, that's a perfect summation. Definitely. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for spending time. I've, I've loved having this conversation. Thank with you. you. Me too. You ask great questions. Oh, thank you. I, I, I'm just, I'm endlessly curious about, about what you do. So it makes it very easy to have a fascinating person to speak to. Oh, so thank you. And I just want to let people know, watch the all seasons of Grace and Frankie on Netflix and, uh, and enjoy them again and again. Thank you so much, Marta Kaufman. Great to talk to you. Thank you.